So welcome to Sunday morning, October 18th, the middle of autumn, really, right? There's still color, but the seasons are changing. We had snow yesterday Woo! in a lot of places, and um, you can feel, feel another transition coming. Um, just a few announcements before we begin the actual worship service. We want to thank Bob Carper and the team of volunteers you know, um, who came out to help build our stairs outside. We have wonderfully new safe treads and a new railing and an external stair that's completed. And so we thank uh, Bob and everybody else who came out and really, you know, gave multiple weekends to that project and thereby conserved the resources of the church um, and made us safe. So thank you for that. And we uh, want to also thank our choir because they have been um, singing both for the church, but they also participated in a state Song. And today we get to hear the unveiling of the song that the whole statewide choir created together. And Billy Carlton helped shape it, and Alan Labrie donated his music to. He has a, a free write in C composition that you might hear under some of the readings today. And also just to note that many of the elements of our worship today were created by the annual meeting planning team and worship team of which I'm a part. It's a statewide team that's been getting together once or twice a month all year long to create both our business meeting which happened yesterday, several of the connecting sessions which have happened over the last week and then the elements some we're going to share some of the elements of the worship that they created including the song. We have a guest sermon from Reverend Michael Kane and some other pieces. So if you see unfamiliar faces or multiple voices, those are the voices of our conference and our statewide, both our ministers and, and lay people sharing with us some of their thoughts. We're going to use some of the other worship elements for communion in a couple of weeks. So you'll see these elements spread out over a few weeks. But thank you to everybody who participated in helping create our footprint in the statewide experience and yeah I think those are my announcements are there other announcements I'm thinking about the special offering Jeanette do we need to make another announcement for that can't hear you well that might be me Uh, nobody can hear you, Jeanette. Something's going on with your sound. Okay. Well, we're going to do our best to remember that there is a special offering that the UCC takes up, and I believe that we mailed out envelopes to people if they wish to do, use them. And you can probably, you, you may be able to, I don't think you can find envelopes in the pews, but if you want to make a contribution to the special offering that the UCC takes up once, a, once or twice a year, there are several different ministries. You can designate it to anyone. Just make a note. I think the envelope gives fairly clear instructions. And we can also send that out by email just to make it clear. So if people are making a designated donation online, you can do it that way too. Um, the, I will say that from the annual meeting, there, were good, there was good information such as given the state of things, the, the, um, the conference has saved quite a bit of money and yet they have, um, so we're, we're going to come into the black at the end of this year as a statewide conference, which is a big deal. Um, they save money in some areas, but giving has been really steady and strong. And the, the special offerings that we give this month will be part of what will make up the difference in some areas where there's still a, a gap going. But uh, we've, we've been strong partners with the state, so just to say Thank you for that as well. I have um, an announcement, Gail. Sure. Uh, I see lots of our deacons here. The deacons meet, will be meeting this Tuesday via mm -hmm. Zoom 
and we put the time at five o'clock so those who are working can um, actually get to the meeting. So Deacon's five o'clock this Tuesday and I believe council meeting is Wednesday evening by Zoom. Yep, at seven. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, seven o'clock. Uh, Deacon's five on Tuesday, council seven o'clock. Gail, I have an announcement. <laughs> yes, okay, go for it, Bob. Some of, some, this is for generally for using Zoom. Uh, some of you know that I had a problem with my computer and it wasn't here in my microphone over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I, um, uh, what I did, uh, which solved the problem, is I downloaded, or I uninstalled Zoom and then reinstalled it. And that corrected the problem if anybody else is having a similar problem. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. Yeah. yeah, I think with some of the updates they've been doing, sometimes you have to just almost take away what you have and, and re restart it. Um, uh, Jeanette's reminding me that if you receive the church newsletter by email, the information for the special offering is in there. So that certainly will work. And I just saw a couple messages coming through saying hardworking boys, appreciation again for the building team that was out there working on the stairs. All right. Um, so our, our worship today will be a hybrid of what we typically do and some of the elements that have been shared with us by the state. Um, and I did listen to the keynote speaker yesterday, and he's a very good speaker, so he should be worth listening to yet again today. So I'm looking forward to that. And with that, I'm going to suggest that we enter into the call to worship. And I can't even remember exactly how this is going to go. I don't know if there's a part for you guys to read or if it's completely read by the volunteers that prepared it. But we're going to use the call to worship to center ourselves and enter a time of worship now. Beloved, will you join us in our call to worship? You, living God, have always meant to crown us with your steadfast love. It is this love that does not forget us, but forgives, satisfies, and renews our strength. Without your love, the wind passes over us and leaves us unknown. Today, we humbly ask you for transformation and renewal through this love. We receive from you what is good and acceptable. We remember that although we are many, we are one body. We strive to let go of our temptation for legalism and let our love be genuine. Though we see struggle ahead, we will not lag in zeal, but will be ardent in spirit, holding fast to what is good. We trust that you will make our body strong. We trust that you shall make us like water gardens, springs that shall not fail. Thanks be to you, O oh God. Yay. <laughs> That's the first piece of what the conference created together. Um, this is all based around Isaiah 58, which is the passage that was chosen by the planning team to help frame how we are thinking about these times, thinking about COVID, thinking about social unrest and upheaval and inequity, thinking about the politics that divide us and, and continue to be a stressful time for all of us. So this is a call to rebuilding, restoring, and renewing our relationships with each other, our community, our world, uh, the environment, different populations in so many ways to rebuild, renew, and restore. So that's the theme that you're going to be hearing throughout today. And now we're going to do our own tradition, which is our prayers. Um, we start with prayers of concern, and then we move to any prayers of celebration. And I'm just going to share on behalf of our family that um, our son-in-law, Niru's family in Nepal is now struggling with COVID. His grandfather passed away a few days ago, 
due to complications from COVID and other underlying conditions. And it is very present there. We know also that the numbers in New Hampshire have doubled. So, um, you know, we continue to live with this reality and it is more dangerous than we sometimes think if we're living in an area where we're largely not seeing its full impact. So let us hold in prayer all those that work to keep the others safe during COVID and for those who have been diagnosed with it and are living with it and for families that lose their loved ones due to COVID and sometimes lose them and cannot be with them. And for the deep mourning that is going on in this country because of COVID and other additional challenges. Um, are there prayers in the Zoom world of concern that you would like to raise up out loud? Well, I'm going to name that we have a few folks in our own congregation, some of whom are right here, who are going to have procedures coming right up for different parts of their bodies. And so we are thinking of those who have eyes and hips that need to be cared for um, and holding you in the light. I'm sure there's other procedures that I don't know about yet that also require attention and others that go unnamed that are ongoing treatments for cancer um, and other types of very serious life limiting conditions, people that are living with uh, Alzheimer's and other cognitive changes, people living with the aftermath of stroke, people living, um, you know, here's Jan and Barry who continues to live with the aftermath of an accident that took away much of his mobility and people that are living with mental health challenges. We have many, many people that have well-managed conditions, but in these times, mental health, people that live with depression, suicidality, anxiety, many different forms of, of neurological health that are particularly hard pressed right now. Um, many, we have, I've had several prayer requests recently in that area. So for all those whose, whose health is not visible, but who continue to live with challenges, may there be light within. And so now we're going to take a couple of prayer requests from the congregation here in the church. Kevin has a prayer request. Okay, so prayers for good health for a lot of people, including people in our congregation and Kevin's fiance. Keep going, Kevin. Okay, and, and Kevin's trying to change his housing location. So for those that are don't feel safe or settled where they are, who are making changes, or for those who even reluctantly are leaving a place that they love um, and restarting their lives in new places. And Sandy has shared with us that she's headed for Ohio. Um, and every time that somebody has to leave us, it's something that creates its own kind of grief because we feel the absence of every community member, and we're glad for new people that come to us, and we have those stories too, but it's hard to say goodbye to people that need to go somewhere else. And the beauty of Zoom is that we can still be connected, right? We have people Zoomed in here from a lot of different places right now, and we are still feeling connected, at least in that way. So we are grateful for the gifts of that. Um, Alan's got a prayer request. Okay. Ongoing prayers for Father Steve, who is the priest at Our Lady of the Mountains and who, as we know, has been pray, uh, working with his parents and he's, he's been in contact with the church, but he um, 
he continues to need their prayers and all of our prayers, as does his church. Um, I'm going to turn us to prayers of joy, and I want to say I got to officiate at Deanna Botsford's wedding yesterday, and it was outside, and the rain broke, and then the clouds rolled back, and the sunlight fell down into the yard and turned their wedding golden and colorful and chilly and beautiful. Um, just just enough time. There, the sun came down just for the ceremony, and then it went away again right when they were about to take pictures, but they got dry and sunshine, and they didn't weren't sure they'd get it. Um, so prayers of gratitude for that. And again, for the special music that we have today. And I also wanted to say that I was in touch with Po Jen about 10 days ago. Po Jen, for anyone who doesn't know that, is our former minister here. And he had called to check in, particularly because he'd heard about Bill Gravink um, and was in touch with their family. So we were talking about that, but he he's doing really, really well. He said he's healthier than he was before he left here. He walks by the Potomac almost every day. He's preaching two or three times a month. And um, we've invited, we're have invited. we going to see if we can find a time for him to be a guest preacher up here as well by Zoom. So you can see his cheerful face and hear his wonderful positive message. So just to know that uh, Po Jen's thinking of all of you and we're thinking of him and he's doing well and he holds all of you in his prayers. And sends you his love and his affection. Prayers of happiness from Zoom first. Anybody have any happiness in Zoom? Oh, Sue's happy. I see your finger. You have to unmute. I am thrilled over the top to be able to buy a special little German Shepherd puppy for my granddaughter who is Aww. autistic. And I call it, I call it God's medicine. That's what I'm calling it. Cause you should see the smile on her face. So a new little member of their family and it will bring joy and happiness. So for a German shepherd puppy coming into the house, and I, I'm going to say um, happiness for the youth. So three families showed up today to help do pet blessings so we blessed a cat, a bunny, several dogs, <laughs> and, um, you know, they, the animals bring their own special joy, and when people pause to think what the gifts are that animals bring into their lives and then ask for a blessing for their pets, it just kind of reframes your way of thinking. So we are grateful for the animals in our lives and the kids that were there to help bless them, and, and they stay to allow that to happen. Other prayers inside Zoom of celebration. Okay, Kevin's got his hand up, so we're going to let Kevin go. Go ahead. Kevin is grateful for his um, his fiance Maritza's brother's better health because he was also he had COVID and he's uh, responding well and recovering. Um, Kevin's also grateful for the sunshine, the birds, and the kind people that he meets along the way during his life. Are there any other celebrations? I think Alan's got a celebration. Gratitude for the choir and their voices, um, and gratitude, for, again, for Alan's music that is also part, we already heard it, just very lightly underneath the call to worship. Alan gave us permission to use his composition for this, this state meeting in the worship. Let us join together in prayer, and then we are going to hear the Lord's Prayer as it was prepared by some of the children of the conference. So 
Holy God, uh, we walk through the stripes of shadow and sunshine and a sun that is moving a little further. Well, we're moving further from the sun, but it shines through the leaves and it shines on the frost and the mountains are white at their top and the world is wet and changing and cold and a little raw and amazingly breathtakingly beautiful and everything everything around us is changing we are approaching an election whose results we won't know for a while but we are reminded again and again that before and after that event like any event we will be the same community and though we may be changed in certain ways we are called to belong to each other and so we uphold together in prayer the request for peace and healing for all those that we have named for all those that we have not named but who we hold quietly in prayer for our partner church, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe, for our villages in Honduras who have also been so deeply touched by COVID, for families around the world, including our family, extended into Nepal now, and for here, right here, where we live, our bodies, our minds, our hearts, we pray for wise leadership, for courageous leadership at every level, for patience and an acknowledgement of the holiness of every life and that God is present in each of us. And with that prayer, we turn ourselves once more to you. We hand our lives over to you. And we lift up the prayer that you first taught us that unites us, the Lord's Prayer. Please join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. 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 Uh, that that was from Horton Center. Um, like so many other things, camp was not canceled but changed. Those were children that would have otherwise been up on top of one of our mountains and instead had camp from home. And as I hear it, tons of campers and their parents and 24 deans and a whole lot of other counselor volunteers over the course of the summer created amazing curriculum that they could share remotely and camp still happened and that's a piece of camp they shared prayer with us so those are our campers from around the state and now i would like to turn us towards the scripture itself which is again read by a young person this is isaiah 58. oh you know what Chris is stopping me because we're not going to scripture till we hear our anthem. Ha! Thank you, Lord. All right. Um, Billy, I think, is Billy, Billy's here, and Billy's going to say something about this song, and then we're going to hear the song. Woo. Morning, everyone. How are we all doing today? All right. So um, over the uh, summer, I got asked to direct a choir for the UCC conference. Um, and this co um, choir was a collection of just about 30 singers from across the state of New Hampshire. Um, and so we, um, I arranged this uh, arrangement of All Are Welcome, Let Us Build a House, um, one of the traditional hymns in the hymn books that we have. Um, and I want to say in August, we had two weeks to rehearse and prepare our song. So we had about, I want to say six or seven rehearsals over a span of two weeks. 
um, working to um, working on our music and um, recording our music as well. So I am proud to um, showcase this um, production with all of you. This is meant, this was an absolutely great project for not just me, not just our choir, but for the whole state of New Hampshire, showing that it is possible to still have a choir performance, um, even in the virtual age that we are in right now due to COVID-19. So um, in this choir, we had recordings from Meg, Jeanette, Bob, Steve, and Kate as well. And they all had really good recordings as well as everyone else did. So please sit back and relax and enjoy this production. As well, I just wanted to mention as well, we had Alan Labrie on piano as well. I forgot about that. Sorry, Alan, but he did an absolutely wonderful job on the piano for this. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Yep. Thank you. Much appreciated. So there you go. That is the um, story of, and just just so everybody knows, the um, the vi the views you saw, if you were able to watch the video were views from Horton Center on Pine Mountain, which is just up the road from us. So 
of the photography is one of the sacred places that the entire conference holds in trust and where our children usually get to attend in person in camp and where Chris and I are deans. Um, so, and you know what? I, I had not seen the full video until just now and actually I think they did a great job of, of melding the, the views with the words. I'm, I'm really pleased with what the conference has been able to put together um, but thank you again for our musicians because we were really well represented in the conference's overall effort this year. Uh, this is a huge footprint for us to have up north in, in a conference. Usually we're like one or two people, so much appreciated. Now we will turn to the passage Isaiah 58 as it is read by one of the youth of our conference. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9 through 12. Then you shall call, and God will answer. You shall cry for help, and God will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, pointing of the finger, speaking of evil. If you offer your food to the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. God will guide you continually, and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. And as I say, that is a passage from Isaiah. It was intended in Isaiah's own time or the writer of that message's own time to provide hope for people that had been living in exile, who had lived in diaspora, who'd been oppressed by multiple empires and who were beginning to look at the hope of returning to their homes and lives that were so meaningful to them after generations of being removed from that hope. And it's a very powerful text to turn to today. And now I turn over to Reverend Michael Cain, who is our guest preacher this morning, the message drawn from Isaiah 58. Good Sunday morning, New Hampshire Conference. Good Shabbos, our observant Jewish neighbors might say. I mean it. What a delightful Sunday morning. When in the midst of everything that understandably could have kept you apart, you've come together despite it all. Well done, church. Well done. I've enjoyed being with you to get to know you a bit this weekend. I thank your conference minister, and the annual meeting planning committee for the opportunity. My knowledge of New Hampshire and the UCC here is admittedly limited. I have parishioners in Philadelphia who summer in Temple, New Hampshire. When I told them I was gonna mention this, they worried it's such a small town, many of you might not even know where it is. Their daughter, Meg, in 2016, flew down with your conference's youth to the national youth event that was happening at Disney World. I was with the rest of my youth on an endless chartered bus ride from Philly for about the same price as Meg's plane ticket. So I already think that the New Hampshire Conference is smarter than the Pennsylvania Southeast Conference. Otherwise, I only knew a few of you before this. Um, Carlos from the planning committee, he brought a group to Old First last winter. And Marin Tirabasi and I worked together in New York Conference on a congregational revitalization program some years ago. In those same years, I rode my bicycle from Syracuse to Grand Rapids and General Synod with Martha, Martha Paulson Clement from the Congregational Church of Laconia. And of course, David Felton, um, my dear friend, 
and former colleague from New York Conference. He's serving as an interim at the First Church in Jaffrey right now, which I believe is right next door to the not so unknown town of Temple, New Hampshire. David is also your conference's bridge ACM this fall. Those few, and I guess an inter interterm course I took way, way back in the 80s at Union Seminary with Bill and Susie Briggs about their ministry in Franconia. I think that's about all the New Hampshire cred I've got. But you've given me an incredible text in Isaiah to work with. And the gospel lesson of a Sabbath healing is awfully good news too. Hopefully with those two and the help of the Holy Spirit and the openness of God's people to hear the Spirit's message to the church, I'll have everything I need. Will you pray with me? May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And all God's children say, Amen. Isaiah 58 thrust us into a difficult time, as if our times aren't hard enough. A difficult time when the Israelites, returning home from the Babylonian exile, found that the restoration of their capital city and nation was not as easy as they had hoped or expected. This is the context for those lines about repairing, restoring, renewing that are our focus. People of good faith long to see what's broken get fixed. Because we understand how much damage and hurt that brokenness brings. We want the mess cleaned up. We want what's wrong made right. We want every valley raised up and the mountains and the hills made low. Especially when there seems to be so much mess, so much wrong, so much brokenness. Shattered people, split families, corruption, racial divides, political polarization and paralysis, the opioid crisis, climate change, and all of the environmental chaos it's churning up, our government's inability to mount an effective, comprehensive response to the pandemic, skyrocketing unemployment, horrifying, horrifyingly large prison populations. Repair, restore, renew so that all that is wrong can be made right. To be the repairers of the breach, to rebuild the nation, to restore the church. But our passage, church, isn't just a hopeful promise. It's God's telling the people, us, what to do. Actually, it's God telling us what we're doing wrong and what we should be doing instead. There's more in these verses, church, than those three heroic phrases. Actually, if we read the text carefully, I hope we will, if we follow God's reasoning closely, those three vaunted re's, repairing, rebuilding, renewing, oops, repairing, rebuilding, restoring, are not the means to an end, they are the result, a reward that comes of undertaking the correction God has offered the people. And what is that? What is God asking of us? First, God warns us not to be too sure of ourselves. Right before where we began the reading this morning, the people have shifted the blame for their troubles, not just to some scapegoat or to some favorite enemy, but to God, complaining, we have done everything that you've asked, but you aren't paying attention. You're not caring for us. Their immediate goals were to get the temple rebuilt for worship, to get a wall built around the city for protection, and to get right religion back into people's daily lives. 
from Babylon, second Isaiah, the prophet, had promised a triumphant return and a fabulous restoration of the community. And the exiles had taken that prophecy to heart. The imaginations of those longing to get back home had heard and maybe even magnified a remaking of Jerusalem and the nation to their former glories. But now they're back and the prophecy is the prophecy is not turning out to be at least as easy as they expected. The rebuilding of the temple and the city was stalled completely. The roads weren't even getting repaired. Leadership within the community was contested. Political divisions and violent disagreements were holding pro progress back. Restoration, both physical and social, was at a standstill. Drought and food shortages exacerbated the social strife and made rebuilding even more difficult. Economic and social inequities, homelessness, hunger, lack of clothing, threatened the stability and identity of the Judean community. Groups outside of the community regarded the returnees with suspicion. And the returnees themselves disagreed about how welcoming to outsiders they should be. Texts composed around the time are rife with this tension. Ezra and Nehemiah offer the exclusivist position. Third Isaiah and Ruth promote an inclusive viewpoint. There was turning out to be nothing particularly glorious about their situation, about their circumstances, or about the prospects for Jerusalem and the nation. Now, before we go any further, I want to stop for a minute and step back from the 6th century BCE, or maybe step forward 2,500 years. Because if you've been listening carefully, some of their troubles probably sound sort of familiar. Echoes, not perfect parallels, but the similarities that hunger for making the nation great again that wasn't panning out. Some desperation to get back into their sacred space so that they could be faithful again. Leadership at each other's throats, locked in a fight such that nothing was getting done, Physical infrastructure and cultural identity both desperately needing to be rebuilt, but no progress. Economic inequality that has become so great it's undercutting general social well-being and making peaceful coexistence difficult. There's a housing shortage. Minimum wage isn't a living wage. There are disagreements about diversity and assimilation. There's even this business about the wall that, hasn't, that wasn't yet finished. Similarities enough, I think, church. We might listen to what God says to the returned exiles in order to understand what God is asking of us. And what would that be? I believe that God says, what we do today in worship, and any day, what we do in worship needs to be more than rote ritual. It needs to be more than self-justification. It needs to be more, uh, more than about us making ourselves comfortable. If church is going to be authentic, it has to be less self referential. I mean, real church is about the real world. And so it includes reflections and references and implications of what's going on around us. Real worship doesn't just challenge us, it has to change us. Now you might not 
like my parallels. You might think they're too political, but if you argue with the connection I'm trying to make, you might be arguing with God and not the preacher because God says the church is only really church if it changes how we handle everything else. Duke Ellington's Come Sunday is in our New Century hymnal. We sing it in this service. It's number 602. We call it Savior God Above in the New Century hymnal because we sometimes like to change words. Thank you, Ashley, for leading us in it so beautifully. It's one of Ellington's most amazing compositions. He originally wrote it for black, brown, and beige, his musical reflection on the lives and experience of black people in the Americas. Come Sunday is about the plight of overworked and underpaid African Americans in the South, who on Sunday, on Sunday at church, in worship, among the saints, these people oppressed and hard pressed all week, on Sunday they find a freedom. They could really come together. They could sing and shout. They could worship their hearts out. And they could find the courage and the hope to face so much of what was wrong in their world. An experience of faith so strong it changed how they lived the rest of the week. For me, come Sunday has always felt like an anthem for the kind of church God delights in. The kind of worship Luke captures in the story of the woman healed on the Sabbath. God's answer, New, New Hampshire Conference. In essence, God's answer is, if we do everything right, if we do everything right in worship, if we do everything right in church, but our heart doesn't turn inside out and grow, if we observe every holy and feast and fast day just right, but if we aren't headed, if we aren't healed and sent to heal others, if we don't become apostles, if our worshiping selves don't translate into witnessing lives, if we don't emerge in mercy and justice for the other days of the week, if church doesn't make you big enough to take on the world, then really God says, shaking God's head in sorrow, it's really not church at all. God's talking about so much more than the one or two hours we spend together at church when we can gather, or the hours of our attention when we are apart. Delight in worship turns out to be like the fast that God chooses in this same passage. God says, is not this fast, is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free. Is not the fast I choose to share your bread with the hungry? Likewise, God says, the worship that delights me isn't really about what we think of as worship at all. It's not about right words or right clothes or even about the right congregation. Rather, the worship that delights me, God says, is when you live faithfulness. The returnees thought they needed the temple rebuilt in order to get religion back into people's lives. But God says it's not so much about the buildings or any place set aside as sacred. It's about my teachings that can go with you everywhere. It's not so much about one day of a week or another. It's about my teachings that can be your ways always. So what's this mean for us, church? What's this mean for repair, restore, renew? I think... I think that it means we need to think and see and dream and act bigger. We too often make church too small. We need to get beyond the four walls of our sanctuaries. 
We need to get past the needs of our individual lives. We need to get outside the sacred confines of our Sabbath and include realities that our church life would sometimes rather ignore. True church, like God's love, is a calling about the redemption of the whole world. Keeping Sabbath, healing Sabbath, is healing Sabbath is about recognizing that every day and every person is holy and sacred. Faithfulness is not something we hide away in church about. It's found out in the world where we're tested, witnessing and doing God's work. Church might be good practice, but the test comes out in the world. God says, I delight in more than a Sunday faith. My delight is when you are outside or far from the church building, when no one sees, when you'd rather do something else, but you still do right and love good. So what's this look like in our day to make church bigger, to make church about the world around us? Protecting the environment, caring for the poor, forgiving often, fighting for the powerless, sharing earthly and spiritual resources, embracing diversity, loving God, enjoying life. Now, if that litany sounds familiar, it's what we in the United Church of Christ call being the church in all seasons, in all circumstances, in all places. New Hampshire Conference, let us every day keep Sabbath and be the church. Amen. I'm just curious, um, if you guys want to unmute, I'm just curious, did that, um, how did that message go over for all of you? It resonated very much with me. Uh, Tom, you're muted. Still muted. There you go. <laughs> oh, I, thought, <clears throat> I thought it was tremendous. Great. Uh, absolutely. Um, okay. Well, and, um, Sue, it looks like you're in. Nope. <clears throat> okay. Anybody else have a thought they want to weigh in with? Great. Okay, so Kevin has a thought. Go ahead. Kevin says he was amazing and you got to live what you learn outside of the church. And try to do good and be good even when you don't feel like it. Even when it's hard. <laughs> good takeaway. Uh, as I said, um, it's a good framing text for these times. And yes, Reverend Michael Cain was political, but uh, the political world in which Isaiah lived and the political world in which Christ lived and the political world in which we live, the economic world, the social world, the physical, material, mortal world in which we live is can't be separated from the church. So I think it's good to know that we're not the first people to live inside these contexts, but the, the sacred scripture on which we draw has been set inside human context the whole way along. And so they, they have something to say to us then and now. Uh, to clarify, some of the elements that he was referring to were things we didn't use the entire spectrum of all the things that the conference offered. I think it would have overwhelmed us and also kept us longer than we might want to go. And I also think the interactive components of what we do are too important to not have each week. So we're going to spread out some of the things that were prepared by the worship team over a few weeks. Um, so the rest of this service is all...
plus there's extra other people um conference doing um this i'm in church that we have made a promise to each other and we ask that you continue to, to make that commitment known you know financially and with your time we know we're so good at taking care of each other i think um, and your contributions help this church continue to be small but bigger, right? Just the way that Reverend Michael Kane asked us to be bigger than we might be. I think we're, we've been stretching ourselves a long time to be bigger than we look like from the outside anyway. Um, but your gifts help us, and we thank you for your steady giving. You can always go to jxncc.org, or you can use the envelopes you receive from the church or you can mail in or drop off a contribution as you are able and with that i turn us to the benediction <laughs> and you got to hear a little bit of alan's playing <laughs> and so uh you can stay muted and sing along with the benediction that's led by bob carper mm -hmm. 